Hello, everybody. Hi, how are you all doing? Happy to see you. So tonight, what we are going to do is we are going to take a look at some of the, uh, the kings that were involved in helping the Buddha. And then afterwards, we're going to just look at your ideas about what you think the Buddha was actually doing when he was teaching. What was he actually doing? And also, we want to maybe talk a little bit about Visaka because we didn't have very much time to talk about Visaka last time. So we can do that also. Out of the way. So start. Okay. Namatsa Dosa Samuas Mutasa Dosa Mutasa. Namasa Bhagavata Varato Nama Sambudasa. Homage to him, the blessed one, the worthy one, the fully enlightened one. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. So when we look at this and we listen tonight, this is the Buddha's royal patrons that we're going to talk about. Starts out with a saying by Mahakasapa Teragata in 1053 AD. A treacherous bog it is, this patronage of vows and gifts and treats from wealthy folk. Tis like a fine dart bedded in the flesh for erring human hard to extricate, hard to take it out. Kim, this is the King Bimbisara first we talk about. King Bimbisara, who ruled in Magadha with its capital at Rajagaha, was the Buddha's first royal patron. Ascending the throne at the age of 15, he reigned for 52 years. When Prince Siddhartha renounced to the world and was seeking alms in the streets of Rajagaha, as a humble ascetic, the king saw him from his palace and he was highly impressed by his majestic appearance and his dignified deportment. Immediately, he sent messengers to ascertain who he was. On learning that he was resting after his meal under the Pandava Pabada tree, the king, accompanied by his retinue, went up to the royal ascetic and inquired about his birthplace and his ancestry. The ascetic Godama replied, Just straight, O king, upon the Himalaya, there is in the district of Kosala of ancient families, a country endowed with wealth and energy. And I am sprung from the family which by clan belongs to the solar dynasty by birth to the Sakyas. I crave not for pleasures of the senses, realizing the evil of sensual pleasures and seeing renunciation as safe. I proceeded to seek the highest, for in that my mind rejoices. <clears throat> Thereupon, the king invited him to visit his kingdom after his enlightenment. And so that meeting took place as he was a bodhisattva, still seeking. Now, the Buddha meets King Bimbisara in accordance with the promise 
the Buddha made to King Bimbisara before his enlightenment, he and his large retinue of Arahant disciples went from Gaya to Rajagaha, the capital of the district of Magadha. And here he stayed at the Supatita shrine in a palm grove. This happy news of the Buddha's arrival in the kingdom and his high reputation as an unparalleled religious teacher, it soon spread in the city. And the king, hearing of his arrival, came with a large number of his subjects to welcome the Buddha. He approached the Buddha, respectfully saluted him, and sat down at one side. Of his subjects, some respectfully saluted him. Some looked towards him with expression of friendly greetings. Some saluted him with clasped hands, and others introduced themselves, while others, in perfect silence, took their seats. As both the Buddha Gotama and Venerable Kasapa were held in high esteem by the multitude, they were not certain whether the Buddha was leading the holy life under Venerable Kasapa, or the latter was leading the holy life under the former. And the Buddha read their thoughts and questioned out loud Venerable Kasapa as to why he had given up his fire sacrifice. Understanding the motive of the Buddha's question, Kasapa explained that he abandoned the fire sacrifice because he preferred the passionless and peaceful state of Nibbana to worthless sensual pleasures. And after this, he fell at the feet of the Buddha and acknowledged his superiority and said to him, my teacher, Lord, is the exalted one. I am the disciple. My teacher, Lord, is the exalted one. I am the disciple. The devout people around him were delighted to hear this conversation. The Buddha thereupon preached the Maha Narada Kasapa Jataka to show how in a previous birth, when he was born as Narada, still subject to passion, he converted Kasapa in a similar way. Hearing the Dhamma expounded by the Buddha, the eye of truth arose in them all. King Bimbisara attained Sotapati and seeking refuge in the Buddha, the Dhamma and the Sangha invited the Buddha and his disciples to his palace for a meal on the following day. Now, after the meal, the king wished to know where the Buddha would reside. And the Buddha replied that a secluded place was what he needed, neither too far nor too close to the city, accessible to those who desire to visit him, pleasant, not crowded during the day, and not too noisy at night, with as few sounds as possible, very airy and fit for the privacy of men, that would be most suitable. Well, the king thought that his bamboo grove would meet all such requirements. Therefore, in return for the transcendental gift the Buddha had bestowed upon him, he gifted for the use of the Buddha and the Sangha that park, which was ideally secluded in a bamboo grove, also known as the sanctuary of the squirrels. It would appear that this park had no building for the use of the bhikkhus, but it was filled with many shady trees and secluded spots. However, this was the first gift 
of a place of residence for the Buddha and his disciples. The Buddha spent three successive rainy seasons and three other rainy seasons in this quiet Baluvanarama. After his conversion, the king led the life of an exemplary monarch observing Upasata regularly day of the month. Kosala Devi, daughter of King Maha Kosala and sister of King Pasanadi of Kosala, was his chief loyal queen. Ajisatu was her son. Kema, who through the ingenuity of the king, became a follower of the Buddha and who later rose to a position of the first female disciple of the order of the nuns, was another queen at that time. Though he was a pious monarch, yet due to his evil karma, he had a very sad and a pathetic end. Prince Ajatasattu, successor to the throne, instigated by wicked Devadatta Tara, attempted to kill the Buddha and usurp, kill his father and usurp the throne. The unfortunate prince was caught red-handed and the compassionate father, instead of punishing him for his brutal act, rewarded him with the coveted crown. The ungrateful son, however, showed his gratitude to his father by casting him into prison in order to starve him to death. His mother alone had free access to the king daily. The loyal queen carried food concealed in her waist pouch. The prince and then he carried and ordered his mother not to visit his father any longer. King Bimbasara was without any means of sustenance, but he paced up and down enjoying spiritual happiness as he was a Sotapanna. Ultimately, the wicked son decided to put an end to the life of his noble father. Ruthlessly, he ordered his barber to cut open his soles and put salt and oil thereon and make him walk on burning coals. The king who saw the barber approaching, thought that his son, realizing his folly, was sending the barber to shave his grown-in beard and hair and release him from prison. Contrary to his expectations, he had to meet an untimely and sad end. The barber mercilessly executed the inhuman orders of the barbarous prince. The good king died in great agony. On that very day, the son was born unto Ajatasattu. Letters conveying the news of the birth and death reached the palace at the same time. A letter conveying happy news was first read. Lo, the love he cherished towards his firstborn son was indescribable. His body was thrilled with joy and paternal love, which perpetuated up to the very marrow of his bones. Immediately rushed to his beloved mother and questioned, My dear, did my father love me when I was a child? What say you, son, she said. When you were conceived in my womb, I developed a craving to sip some blood from the right hand of your father. 
This I dare not say. Consequently, I grew pale and thin. I was finally persuaded to disclose my inhuman desire, but joyfully your father fulfilled my wish, and I drank that abhorrent potion. The soothsayers predicted that you would be an enemy of your father. Accordingly, you were named Ajatasattu, the unborn enemy. I attempted to effect a miscarriage, but your father prevented it. And after you were born, again, I wanted to kill you. Again, your father interfered. On one occasion, you were suffering from a boil in your finger and nobody was able to lull you to sleep. But your father, who was administering justice in his royal court, he took you into his lap and caressing you. He sucked the boil until it was clean. Low inside the mouth, it burst open. Oh, my dear son, the pus and blood was terrible. Yes, your affectionate father swallowed it out of love for you. Instantly, he cried out, run, run, release my beloved father quickly, he cried. His father, however, had closed his eyes forever in the prison. The other letter was then placed in his hand. A and was immediately afterwards born a Deva who was named Janava Sabha in the Katuma Parajika heaven. Later, Ajatasattu met the Buddha and became one of his distinguished lay followers and took a leading part in the holding of the first convocation. Now we look to King Pasanadi in Kosala. King Pasanadi in Kosala. He was the son of Maha Kosala, who reigned in a kingdom of Kosala with its capital at Sawati. He was another royal patron of the Buddha. He was a contemporary of the Buddha. And owing to his proficiency in various arts, he had the good fortune to be made king by his father while he was alive. His conversion must probably have taken place during the very early part of the Buddha's ministry. In the Samyutta Nikaya, it is stated that once he approached the Buddha and questioning him about his perfect enlightenment, he referred to him as being young in years and young in ordination. That is in the Samyutta Nikaya 1.64 in the Kindred Sayings, number one, page 94, if you find it. The Buddha replied, there are four objects, O Maharaja, that should not be disregarded or despised. And they are a katya, a warrior prince, a snake, fire, and a bhikkhu, mendicant monk. The note on this, says an enraged warrior prince, though young, may ruthlessly harm others. The bite of even a small snake could be fatal. A little fire may produce conflagration. Even a young monk could be a saint or a Dhamma scholar. And then he delivered an interesting sermon on this subject to the king. At the close of the sermon, the king expressed his great pleasure and instantly became a follower of the Buddha. Since then, till his death, he was deeply attached to the Buddha. It is said that on one occasion, the king prostrated himself before the Buddha 
and stroked his feet, covering them with kisses. That can be found in the Majima Nikaya in Sutta number 120. His chief queen was Malika, a very devout and wise lady, well-versed in the Dhamma, was greatly responsible for his religious enthusiasm. Like a true friend, she had to act as his religious guide on several occasions. Now, one day, the king, he dreamt 16 unusual dreams and was greatly perturbed in his mind, not knowing her sacrifice of an animal to ward off the dangers resulting therefrom. As advised, he made all the arrangements for an inhuman sacrifice, which would have resulted in the loss of thousands of helpless creatures. Queen Malika, hearing of this barbarous act about to be perpetuated, persuaded the king to get the dreams interpreted first by the Buddha, whose understanding infinitely surpassed that of those worldly Brahmins. Now the king approached the Buddha and mentioned the object of his visit, relating the 16 dreams. He wished to know their significance. And the Buddha explained their significance fully to him. Unlike King Bimbisara, King Kosala had a good fortune to hear several edifying and instructive discourses from the Buddha. In the Samyutta Nikaya, there appears a special section called the Kosala Samyutta in which are recorded most of the discourses and talks that were given by the Buddha to the king. Now, once while the king was seated in the company of the Buddha, he saw some ascetics with hairy bodies and long nails passing by. Rising from his seat respectfully saluted them, calling out his name to them. I am the king, your reverences the Kosala, Pasanadi. And when they had gone, he came back to the Buddha and wished to know whether they were arahants or those who were striving for arahantship. But the Buddha explained that it was difficult for ordinary laymen enjoying material pleasures to judge whether others are arahants or not and made the following interesting observations. It is by association only, samvasana, that one's conduct, shila, is to be understood. And that too, after a long time, not in a short time, by one who is watchful and not by a heedless person, by an intelligent person and not by an unintelligent one. It is by conversing, samvaharana, that one's purity, susanyang, is to be understood. It is in time of trouble that one's fortitude is to be understood. It is by discussion that one's wisdom is to be understood and that too after a long time and not in a short time by one who is watchful and not by a heedless person by an intelligent person not by an unintelligent person summing up the above the buddha uttered the following verses to be remembered not by his outward guise is a man and well known. In fleeting glance, let none place their confidence. 
in garb of decent, well-conducted folk, the unrestrained live in the world at large. As a clay earring made to be counterfeit, or bronze halfpenny coated on, over with gold, some fare as large hidden beneath their disguise, and without comely and fair within, they may be impure. King Kosala, as ruler of the great kingdom, could not possibly have avoided warfare especially with kings of neighboring countries. And once he was compelled to fight with his own nephew, King Ajatasattu, and was defeated. Hearing it, the Buddha remarked, victory breeds hatred. The defeated live in pain. Happily, the peaceful live, giving up victory and giving up defeat. On another occasion, King Kosala was victorious and he confiscated the whole army of Ajatasattu, saving only him. When the Buddha heard about this new victory, he uttered the following verse, the truth of which applies with equal force to this modern war weary world as well that we live in today. A man may spoil another, just so far as it may serve his ends but when he's spoiled by others he despoiled spoils yet again so long as evil's fruit is not matured the fool doth fancy now is the hour now is the chance but when the deed bears fruit he fareth ill. The slayer gets a slayer in his, in his own turn. The conqueror gets one who conquers him. The abuser wins only abuse. The annoyer wins only friends. Thus, the of a man who spoils is spoiled this term sounds to me like what goes around comes around <laughs> what the buddha has said to king kosala about women is equally interesting and extremely encouraging to women kind once while the king was engaged in a pious conversation with the buddha a messenger came and whispered into his ear that Queen Malika had given birth to a daughter. The king was not pleased at this unwelcome news. In ancient India, as it is to a great extent today, a daughter is not considered a happy addition to a family for several selfish reasons. For instance, the problem of providing a dowry. And the Buddha, unlike any other religious teacher, he paid a glowing tribute to women and mentioned four chief characteristics that adorn a woman in the following words. Some women are indeed better than men. Bring her up, O Lord of men. There are women who are wise, virtuous, who regard mother-in-laws as a goddess and who are chaste. To such a noble wife may be born a valiant son, a lord of realms who would rule a kingdom yet. Some women are even better than men. Ithi he pxi seya were the actual words used by the Buddha. No religious teacher has made such a bold and noble utterance, especially in India where people were not held the women in high esteem. 
deeply grieved over the death of his grandmother, aged 120 years, King Kosala approached the Buddha and said that he would have given everything within his means to save his grandmother, who had been as a mother to him. The Buddha consoled him, saying, all beings are mortal. They end with death. They have death in prospect. All of the vessels wrought by the potter, whether they are baked or unbaked, they are breakable. They finish broken. They have breakage in prospect. The king was so desirous of hearing the Dhamma that even if affairs of state demanded that his presence in other parts of the kingdom should be, he would avail himself of every possible opportunity to visit the Buddha and engage in a pious conversation. The Dhammachetya and the Kanakathala suttas were preached on these occasions. King Kasala's chief consort, the daughter of a garland maker, predeceased him. A sister of King Bimbisara was one of his wives. One of his sisters married to King Bimbisara, and Jatasattu was her son named Vidubhadda who revolted against him in his old age. This son's mother was a daughter of Mahanama, the Sakya, who was related to the Buddha, and his grandmother was a slave girl. This fact, the king did not know when he took her as one of his consorts. Hearing a derogatory remark made by Sakyas about his ignoble lineage, Vidu Dabba took vengeance by attempting to destroy the Sakya race. Unfortunately, it was due to Vidu Dabba that the king had to die a pathetic death in a hall outside the city with only a servant as his companion. King Kasala predeceased the Buddha. So this is the end of Narada's notes on the kings and the royal patrons who had helped. Do you have any questions on any of these characters? Anyone? The other thing that I wondered if we would talk a little bit about was what do you think the Buddha was doing when he's teaching you? What do you think this is all about? I'm throwing it up there. What do you think is going on? What makes the Buddha unique from what else was being taught at the time? Can you see what is different? Do you realize it? Island group tonight. <laughs> I don't see anybody. You need to take your your placeholders and come come see me for a minute. <laughs> what happens in modern times is that we have anyone. Oh, you. Hello. Go ahead. Whoops. Hi. <laughs> Whoop. I can't hear you. Uh, I've just come in. Whoops. 
I think I've I just come on the end of end of this because unfortunately I was uh, working. So I've just literally heard your question, but I haven't heard your talk. Um, I was reading about the two king, the two kings families, you know, that were involved with the Buddha as royal patrons, the Bimbisara and Pasanadi and some of the other characters and the women and everything. And some of the comments that he did that were very supportive of women. And um, also talking about who was married to who. It was, an, it was a, not so much, it was between houses, you know, between houses. Yeah. Not so much uh, right in the same family to each other. Uh, so it, I don't know, but I don't think that in um, India, they suffered so much uh, the blood disease as they did in Europe, where they were marrying even first cousins. They were marrying different houses here, you know, in this situation. So that didn't come up. And then we went into some questions, you know, at the end. Um, one thing you was mentioned were the 16 dreams. I didn't know, I need to see people to know whether you're interested in knowing what the dreams were, because we can have a class on that and go through the 16 dreams to understand what happened. But he thought when he had this, these 16 dreams, they were very evil because the soothsayers said that, but his wife convinced him to go to the Buddha and have them interpreted. But Narada didn't see fit to put the dreams in this chapter, so it wasn't here telling you what they were you know okay and then and then you asked a, a question about uh, what was unique about uh, the buddha's teaching yeah well i you know i i was listening to some people teach this week and it, it's a it's a it's been a something that's evolved in the history line of buddhism we live in a in a an interesting time where anybody can start a new school of Buddhism next week and nobody's going to object and you just go and do it and it starts to happen without any verification or checking into or anything. So there's a lot of uh, a lot of that that happens and it happens in many different ways in, in India it happens too but I, I think that I heard someone teaching right effort, but they didn't realize what was special about it. They were not actually going step by step through it. They were just saying it. And then I, I went and I read the, the sutta the person was teaching and it was the effacement sutta, the mm. effacement sutta, you know, number eight. And when you yes. read the effacement sutta, one of the reasons Bhante never teaches it, I called him today and I said, why, why don't we ever teach that? Is it what I think? And he, he said, well, what do you think? <laughs> you know, and, and I said to him, well, the, the problem I see with the effacement sutta is if you just pull the sutta out and start talking about that, it's just a list. And you could make it fit the Jew, the Muslim, the Christian, the Catholic, or anybody else in the universe that you wanted to make it fit their religion, it would be the same as their religion. So there's nothing unique about the effacement sutta unless you have learned other information. And this is why what provoked me or you know put me forward to just didn't provoke me, but it sort of nudged me to say, what what do you what makes the Buddha is teaching unique from what else was being taught at the time that's one question and and another one is uh, one we always used to talk about at home you know you get out a map of the united states and when somebody says well you know all these things all meditation all roads go to the same place and then Bonte would get a map out and put it on the table and say tell me that all the maps in the united states of roads, they all go to California to San Francisco. <laughs> and of course, they don't, you know, they don't. So, uh, and, that, and then I started thinking, you know, what makes him a Buddha? And then to, to figure that out, if you haven't done it, is to have a class about the nine qualities of the Buddha in depth to understand what they were, the nine qualities were and why why didn't other teachers become Buddhas at that time? What is this, this Buddha? What is it? So I was going to the Pali teacher today and say, well, what, what makes you a Buddha? And she said, well, the nine qualities of the Buddha. Okay, I <laughs> go get the nine qualities and go through that. And then there are very, some very good writing has been done on the nine qualities in depth. I have one really good article I like to use when I teach that. Um, 
but the fact is all roads do not take you to cessation. All roads, like if you were to talk about just meditation without, without criticizing anything, it's about where these meditations go, no matter what they are. I think they all have value, all of them. But I don't think they go the same place as the Buddha took people. And I think that's why he was a Buddha. But if people don't experience the difference, why would they think there's any difference? You see, it's what you run into here. Yeah. Um, so that was one of the questions. And then another question was, if, if it was all the same thing, then why didn't, yeah, you already said this, why didn't someone else become, why didn't the Naganta Naputa end up being a Buddha? Why didn't these other teachers become Buddhas? They had a very different, what, what these, when people start talking that way, they don't talk about the difference in the way the Buddha was teaching. In yeah. India, the tradition is the guru. And the guru, you go to the guru, you ask the question, he tells you the answer, you go home and ponder it. You don't, you don't disagree with the Buddha, you don't debate it I mean, with the guru, you don't debate him. You don't, you don't go back and forth like that, except with some really great ones. Like sometimes I think the one that is was in I Am That, the book I Am That is really incredible. Book. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And, you know, and a lot of that, we can really understand deeply what was going on with this guru by learning what the Buddha actually taught in a vast number of things. I mean, well, like, I yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Jump what in. What I, what I think it, it, the key, some of the key things are um, the, the ethic, ethic, I'm not sure how to say it, ethics, ethicization of the, of karma. In other words, making karma um, uh, have an ethical basis rather than just a, uh, a reductive basis. Um, I think that was very important. I think um, seeing uh, or describing cognition in the way that he did, uh, dependent origination, um, uh, you know, makes it a, a different teaching. Uh, the, the teaching of impermanence was already present in, in, in India. Um, I think the recognizing, and this comes through in the twin teaching, I think if you if you work with a what I would call a hard rather than a soft concentration, it seems to develop a sense of ego in some capacity or other, a sense of identity. Whereas if you work with a soft concentration, it doesn't. It seems to uproot that sense of uh, of hard identity. And I think these are these are very significant differences um, uh, are around that. Um, and uh, you know what made uh, what made the Buddha the Buddha, I suppose, was his work with the Paramis, um, because he was able then, if you like, from his experience and his understanding, to see, if you like, all the leaves in the forest from which he was then able to identify just the leaves required for progress. Exactly, yeah. So he gives us, uh, um, and, and uh, one that I also is anatta, the anatta, the atta anatta story was not figured out the same way. It may have existed in some respects, but we don't find many people going beyond saying uh, self and no self. And that's a tragedy because that, that's not really what this was about. It was about the consequence of believing everything is about me and it's my another it has to do with right view. And these are together the impersonal, discovering the impersonal nature of everything. And then well, I, what is the consequence of an impersonal perspective is much less stressful on the human being than if you have to believe everything that happens is personal. It's one of the places people get terribly, uh, terribly caught up in grief for way long, too long of a time, and it can destroy a person I, well, if I, you believe that everything's about me. I, and I think the important thing is the distinction between not self and 
non-self. It's only a single letter, but it makes a huge difference. And my understanding from my reading of the, of the Buddha's suttas is, you know, the Buddha did not say there was not a self. He wouldn't be drawn on that. He would simply say there is nothing in your experience which has the characteristic of a self. Well, you're speaking about the consequence of if there was not self, how would it be? You know, yeah. the experience would be non-self based, which means what? And so what we went, what we did is an exercise once we went into the Majima Nikaya and we picked out, we tried to look at, you start this way, go to, go to the index. Okay, find Atta and find Anatta. Take all of the of the places it notes that they're popping up. Yep. I'm afraid we've lost you. Or Oh, can you still hear me? Yeah. I lost you, you for about a minute there. Okay. Okay. You, you're, um, what I was saying is you're not, it's not always going to be about self and no self. If you look, when you're doing this, you're researching it, you're going to find personality and non-personality and you're going to find, find um, what is it? Uh, another one, um, identification and non-identification. And that gives you a clue what this was all about identifying everything as me or not or and not just saying it's Im impermanent it, the idea of wanting to carry we want to beat ourselves up <laughs> look at it that's one of the things human beings do you know and and um there's all these little rhymes that happen uh in america there's all these little rhymes for little kids you know Nobody loves me. Everybody hates me. I guess I'll go eat worms. <laughs> and they go sit and cry and that sort of thing because everything is happening to them. So start. it can start at a very, very young age. If people around you are behaving that way or there's someone in the family that is affecting the child, they can pick it up way early. And um, yeah, but the idea of, of not not being a self or non-self involved in everything, looking carefully to say, is this really about me? Is it mine? Is it myself? Or is it something that's just happening in the present time? Yeah. Okay. And now can you tell me if it's happening in the present time, uh, what is essential about this and what is unessential that you're grabbing onto? And when you look at the unessential part of what's happening that you're grabbing onto and you're going to repeat a uh, reaction to something again and again and again, um, if you can start identifying that, then you will stop, give yourself a pause and choose a response instead of a reaction. So this is all tied together. So one of the things I saw when I was looking through stuff um, you know, I, I was, um, I was realizing how um, people like to try to take hold of one or two suttas and say, this is Buddhism, but we can't do that. Mm -hmm. And this is, this is what happened in some of the commentaries, not just the Vasudhimaga and other commentaries as well. It's not just there. It went back to the Vimudi Maga happened there too. You go back and get a copy of that. That you can read that one. See, so the problem is if you um, think that one sutta tells you what Buddhism is, you're in dangerous water because yes. you need to you need to know the parts of what made you say that the support. So if you really someone comes to you and really wants to talk about that subject with you. Uh, you you can't really have a discussion unless you um, you have gone in different parts of it. That's what the third. This is what the thirty seven requisites of enlightenment are about. You can't just take one. You see. Yeah. Another thing that's fun for you if you want to try something interesting is to consider the parts that parts that are there in Buddhism, and and start to investigate them. 
for causal relationships. This is another thing I did a few months ago and I thought it was really fun, you know? So when you have something like five faculties, uh, is there a causal relationship with the operation of these five faculties? Faith, energy, mindfulness, um, concentration and wisdom. Is there, is there some kind of a causal relationship? And you sit and you contemplate the pieces, but then you have to contemplate all five pieces. And you take the steps. Uh, what happens? What happens very often with right effort? The reason that twim got lost. People come to me and they say, "Well, how did people miss this? How? You know, when you're halfway through a retreat and you've gone through your, you've gone for. I was sharing with someone the other day the charts from the retreat we had in Pune, and some women went from 15 minutes to four hours of sitting in 10 days." very clear as a bell and understood everything they were learning and took notes very carefully. Why were those women so effectively on the path and so able to, to make get as far as they did? Why? Well, for one thing, they were green. That means they didn't have any experience with meditation at all anywhere before. They only knew about Christian prayer. These were Catholic nuns, for heaven's sakes. So they weren't taught from the idea of Eastern meditation. They hadn't been exposed to any meditation. This was their, 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 um, their capsule, so to speak, for their training in meditation. They had given it to me to do this with them. So they were empty when we started. That was one thing. They were hot. They were very well educated. And they knew how to take instructions and write down exactly what I said so they would think about that through the night, ask questions, very perfunctory questions, very precise questions that could be answered to connect things together. It was a wonderful experience. I'm not sure who learned more, them or me, <laughs> you know, because it was so healthy to see. Uh, and then the other thing that happened for them was a couple, only two out of 18 in the past. They're all from that's who they are. you again. I'm sorry, again. No, I don't know if it's the same for everyone, but I can't. I can't. Oh, oh we are having you're trouble all day with internet. So, okay, can, you got I it. Can hear you now, okay. but you're not moving. That's fine. You were saying there were two. Two of the women were. Uh, two women had one vipassana retreat, or and one the other one had two. But a number of years ago, there was nothing stuck. There was nothing. No habitual stuff. They had to give up in order to do twim at all. Nothing. You know. They just made a commitment. Everybody, when they go into these sessions for different subjects they have to study, they go in to learn that, that particular piece of information as clean as a whistle and do exactly what you say. You couldn't have asked for better students. It was the most wonderful, wonderful experience just to, just to be able to teach them, you know? And it was done, we had to set the class up in a way it wasn't Buddhist. So in the very beginning, we did a wonderful thing. I, I don't know, I didn't know if I was going to do it or not. And we did it in the beginning. We took the Ten Commandments on one side and we took the five precepts with the extended definitions on the other side. And we ended up with nine precepts and Ten Commandments. And then we explained what I'm teaching you basically is scientific it isn't really religious it's scientific operation of the mind and body and it's teaching you how your brain actually works and it's teaching you how you cognize and how you have how body feeling perception thoughts and consciousness work in the human being and it teaches you the mind body connection and and so they knew this is from the beginning there's no threat against anyone else's religion at all. So it, it, it didn't matter. There was no higher being involved in this because as far as they were concerned, 
The Lord gave them a body and the body is your temple and you take care of your temple. Good. Okay. That's all you need. So now let's look at how it works. That's all. The, the key to this thing, I guess, was I was a 50 year Christian before I've been a, a 30 year Buddhist. <laughs> yeah, well, that, that, would have, that would have reduced the barriers. Yeah. <laughs> Well, and I thought after this happened, I thought this might be interesting to to um, to to write something someday because I remember how annoyed I was once on a train when I picked up a, a book about Buddhism by a Catholic nun who knew nothing about Buddhism. Mm -hmm. And then I picked up another book by a Buddhist writing about Christianity who, who knew nothing about Christianity. <laughs> and I thought, maybe I'm created for this um, in a way I don't understand yet because I've been almost 50-50 here by the time I die, maybe, who knows? <laughs> That's very funny. <laughs> so let, I, you might, you, if you're interested, shall we look at the nine qualities real quick, what the nine qualities of the Buddha were? Because I jotted them down, okay? So you want to put them, you want to put them on the board? Shall we put them on the board? Okay. We yep. do that. Okay. So let me go to the board. Oh, and I didn't turn this on. So Newton has to give me the whiteboard. Just a second. <laughs> Whoa. Hi. Can you, can you give me the, um, oh, you want some water. <laughs> Can you give me the whiteboard? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I can't turn it on. Because I didn't start the session. You started the session, so can you give me the whiteboard? No, no, I mean on the Zoom. Okay. Yeah, on the Zoom. I think I think she's gonna give me the the whiteboard. Okay. So um, you have these, uh, this is something is one of the first things that we were taught to recite. The Arahan, Samasam Buddha, Vija Charna, Sampano, Sugito, Lokawidu, Anutra, Parisadama Sarati, Satade Wamanusanam, Budo, Bhagawa. Okay, that's what we're going to look at. Can I open it? Newton? No. All right, you're just going to have to listen to me. It's all right. So you need to write this down. On the Arahan, it's simply to remember, these are, these are the short definitions for you. Very simple. Oh, I'm the host. Oh, I think I just got the whiteboard. Okay. No. It's not working. <laughs> no, it's, you turned the host over to me, but it won't let me. It's okay. Don't worry about it. Okay. okay. So how it works is if you have to recite these, this is where you can use track of it. So you have 108 beads. That's how this works. And uh, we were taught to do what's called the uh, Burmese turnaround. And I'll show you what it is. I'm not going to do the whole thing. You need to tell me or wiggle or something you if this gets turned off while I'm doing it. Okay, so I can get the whole thing. Okay. Um, it goes Arahan, Samasam Buddha, Vija Charana, Sampano, Sugito, Loko Gidu, Anutoro Parisidama Sarati, Sata Deva Manusanam, Budo, Bhagawa. Then it goes back. And they go, Arahan, 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 Samasam Buddha, Samasam Buddha, Arahan, Arahan, Samasam Buddha, Vijacharana, Sampano, Vijacharana, Sampano, Samasam Buddha, Arahan. So you see what I'm doing? It's a turnaround. You're doing the first word you say uh, twice, and you go through and back and through and back until you get all the way to, um, you go, um, Arahan Samasam Buddha Vijacharna Sampano Sugito Loko Widu Anutra Parisadama Sarati Sata Deva Manu Sanam Budo Bhagawa Bhagawa Arahan Budo 
Sata Dewa Manu Sanam, Anitura Parisadama Sarati, Loka Widu, and Sugato, Vija Charno Sampano, Samasambudo, Arahan. So that's the last one, doubled back. And then the last time you go through straight through again the nine the nine uh, qualities, and it takes you to 108 beads. That's how you do the malas for when you're doing this. So what do we use it for? Well, I'll tell you, <laughs> I had a stroke and Bonte made me do this and it made me so I could concentrate and be confident enough to keep working on one thing at a time. It was a mild stroke, but it was pretty serious at the time. I couldn't go back to work and it really was a shocking experience to go through, but it was, you had to come back to the confidence that you could do something to give something to someone in the world, or you would just feel like you were not, not worth anything. There was nothing for you to do anymore. Obviously, I like the Dhamma, so here I am, okay. So when we say Arahan, we're saying the accomplished one, meaning that he did this and he went through and then he comes out and he is fully awakened and he makes a decision to teach you how to do what he did. That's all he had to teach. There were no textbooks, no libraries, nothing. He was going to teach others how they could go through too. And it, it doesn't have to take long to be able to learn how to go through either. So this is something Sariputta turn, turn, uh, pointed out in one sutta about in the end of the sutta, they said, well, how long does it take someone to do this? He just said, not long, friend, not long. But there's a big if on that. It's not long if you follow the instructions precisely and you don't deviate at all from what you're doing. That's the trick. And so when the person comes who has meditated before, we have to, one of the reasons we move you from breath over into metta is because you've established with your brain through tra constant training of concentration on the breath, a set of habitual tendencies. And some people, uh, the moment they sit down on the floor, their body says, oh, we're going to do breath. And they actually start immediately. You see, that's a habitual development on the brain. and the metta is taught because each person has four little seeds inside of them loving kindness compassion joy and equanimity and most of the time we've never cultivated those seeds and they don't naturally come out in our personality and so when we are learning the uh brahma viharas his father was explaining to him, and this is in number 62 in the Majima Nikaya, why should I learn that? He's questioning because when you're practicing loving kindness, it is impossible for your brain to think thoughts of ill will towards anyone. When it comes to the compassion, you cannot think anything about cruelty, any cruel thoughts about doing anything to anyone. When the joy is the coming, and each one of these are causally related. So these are an example of causally related. We know that now, because if we train the way it was described very, very closely in all the research Bonte did to find this and start to wake it up again, use this practice. When you're working with loving kindness, you don't stop and start compassion. It turns into compassion when the feeling moves up into your head, right? And then when you're working with the compassion, that's when joy comes inside you from the inside out automatically. You didn't do anything to stop the compassion now and start the joy. And then once again, as you go deeper, as you start to go into the alignment even further, then what you're going to find out is that the equanimity has been building all this time. You may have, if you've come to a retreat with me or you have seen drawings I've done, you would know that there's this much, this much um, 
equanimity in the first jhana. And there's this much. Now this much can fall down all over the place and go up, lose it and come back and go away like that. Two-legged equanimity for the second jhana, but it still can fall over, can it? It can still fall over. Three is like a tripod, but a tripod can fall down. You ever see the wind, somebody lose their camera on a tripod in the wind, it's because they didn't face the point of the tripod into the wind and it'll just go over, you see? And then a four-footed equanimity, once you have this four-footed equanimity, you are all set. It's very, very firm. And then you fall into the mental state. So when we look at the, the, the loving kindness, the compassion, the joy and equanimity, they are aligned with first, second, third, and fourth jhana. And then where the um, uh, where you fall into, once you have the stability, you're ready to fall into the mental jhana. So several things are happening to you before you fall into the mental uh, realms. And it has to do with equanimity. It has to do with the quality of your concentration. It has to do with understanding that mindfulness is pure observation to the point of just witnessing something. It's not thinking and stuff. It has the quality of remembering. Remembering what? Remembering that if anything comes up around you, that you simply let go of it and then you relax and smile and come back, you see? So you recognize something's there. You, the Buddha was so clear on this and we, I don't understand how it got lost because just in the Majima Nikai, there's 11 suttas that are explaining abandonment of hindrances very, very clearly. And yet in today's world, in meditation circles, we hear about the egotistical idea that you have to destroy, annihilate, eradicate, suffocate, subdue, and stop the hindrances, or you will never get to the path. There's a big problem with that. And it's what my first dis discussion here was about, Atta and Anatta. Because if you jump in, you raise up Atta after you've gotten down there in the deeper depths, then you're popping out and pushing yourself off course because you're making me do something to something. And the Buddha, the whole system, if you want to, um, you want to think of it in a kind of way you'll never forget it. <laughs> you know, I used to study opera, I trained for it. And if you know, with sound in the, in the, in the uh, orchestra, you know, it's big sound and then it goes away at the end of the symphony until it's finished and then everyone applauds, right? So if we did that in a single example, we would say, you're starting out with your meditation and you're like, really strong voice, really, really strong. And then where does it go? It goes from there, it goes, Ah. And there you go. You've gone all the way down the waterfall of the jhanas. Like I said, the waterfall where you just keep falling off and the hole fills up and you get to fall down the next one, the next one. Oh, you know, I found an old picture someone gave me yesterday of nine waterfalls in Hawaii. I finally found that picture. Uh, it's so great, you know, because I didn't want to have to do this. And now I need to get my little get this onto a, um, you know, a presentation where I can just put it up there and you can watch this. You can see it. You can't make it move. It's too bad. But this waterfall is just coming down through the jungle in Hawaii like this, down nine waterfalls. And that's exactly how you go down into the depths of quiet mind and fall one, two, three, four, infinite space, infinite consciousness, nothingness, and neither perception or non-perception. You're down there in quiet mind. And then it goes away. It goes, goes into a big pool at, the pool at the bottom, you see. It's perfect. Somebody, one of my students sent it to me and I lost it for a long time. So this thing is the stability of equanimity is really important to understand that it doesn't just happen in one burst in the fourth jhana. 
it's not real. You could never get into the second or first or second jhana unless you had let go of enough to allow yourself to feel the loving kindness and to just feel it, you know, move up to your head. Just to do that, you had to have equanimity. It had to be there. Not the forceful kind, the real deep, strong kind. Yeah, it's not forceful. It's just strong. It's steady. It's a steadiness, you see. So let's go through the rest of these. Arahant is the accomplished. Then Samasambuddha means perfectly enlightened. And it means that he went to path. He went down. He experienced it completely the way he's teaching you. It exists. And then he came out and perfectly enlightened. I like to say perfectly awakened. Here it's like perfectly, I guess we could leave this one perfectly enlightened because he's enlightened on how all these pieces work in the 37 requisites. You know, the four foundations of mindfulness, four steps of right effort, four basic spiritual powers, five faculties, five powers, right? seven factors of enlightenment and the eightfold path and they're all causally related if you examine that closely after you've gone really really deep you begin to understand that's causally related right then you take another one vijicharana sampano endowed with knowledge and conduct and or practice now the reason it said practice in what this monk was writing <clears throat> because there's different ways to get to uh the uh, to nibbana there's different ways one way is knowledge and conduct and not so much practice the other is uh, a lot of practice but i think what was lost in the way he was writing is we have to never ever forget those who go down the path and go through are those who receive a parallel training that's to ask yourself, are you receiving a parallel training, not going to class in the Dhamma class here and coming to the retreat here and going to the Dhamma class? I don't mean that. I mean, in conjunction with parallel training in the retreat of the Dhamma being taught through the suttas and examining the way the monks examined it, okay? Subject by subject, seeing the causal relationship of how it's all tied together to help you move to path and move down path. It's really important. Then sugata, sugata means well gone in comprehension and well spoken. So well gone uh, with com comprehension is talking about understanding comprehending how what it means, but also how to use it, the Four Noble Truths, dependent origination, and the three characteristics. And these three pieces, these three systems, they are tied together causally related. And within themselves, they are causally related. So causal relationships are not just a dependent origination. That's what was fascinating to me, to, to look at this and, and consider it and see it. And um, Bhante was laughing at me today when I was talking about this. He says, still interested, is, aren't you? <laughs> I mean, it's been 15 and a half years. And I said, yeah, I'm just like that monk that was in, uh, I forget who it was, the monk that was in UK, a monk, who was, they interviewed him and, and he said, I just got into robes to find out what all this was about. And then he said, how long have you been in robes? He said, well, the robes held on to me and it's been 12 years. In this interview it was 12 years. And I, that's never going to happen to me. Why? Deeper and deeper and deeper in the interconnection of it. And definitively, it was a tapestry. It was not just single threads floating around in a book, the, the suttas. They were interlaced, interwoven with each other like a cloth or a tapestry. So then we go from from uh, comprehension and well-spoken, let's see. Okay, stop, stop being, you're too rough. Stop, stop. Okay. Um, okay, loka we do, uh, sugata is well-gone comprehension and well-spoken. So it means that all that you learn in your comprehension and you start 
talking with people at the same level of development you are, when you start doing that for a while, you begin to get really confident because you see how this is a systematized thing he was teaching and it works the same way with everyone. It just doesn't work at the same rate. That's the problem. You think it's different, but it's working the same way, but it's not working at the same rate because what I have in my head and what those women had in their head, totally different. It took me two or three years to do what they did in one 10 day retreat. And that's the truth. So we the number of worlds. What does that mean? It means that when you okay, when you get into the deeper depths of quiet mind and you're established in your equanimity real strong, if you want to visit different planes to examine whether these things were real or not, you can do that. One of the favorite places everybody wants to know is where is the hell. What's in hell? What is hell? You know, and it's one of those things that you can actually learn how to to visit and then just wait for something to show up and say, well, why are you here? It's all telepathic. And you're in this for three, four hours and you're, you know, you're you're just listening to what the person's telling you. Okay. What's the person telling you? You see? And so that's that's an interesting thing to do but you have to be around somebody who is going to um be there if you accidentally believe this is all real <laughs> i don't know how else to explain that you know uh you could see something absolutely so darn scary when you do this stuff that you need to be around a teacher and I, I cannot tell you how important this is. There was one teacher took a bunch of people into the desert, decided to have this big, uh, you know, retreat on a national forest. They ended up throwing him off the national forest, asking him to leave. But two of the people came out of that retreat who were being taught to do past lives with someone who didn't understand how dangerous it was. And they ended up in a mental hospital because they what they saw, they actually were not enough equanimity there yet to do this kind of work and so what they saw they they thought it was real and they freaked out that was what happened you know so you have to be careful with that and and be with someone that can do it with you or allow you to do it where you can question them constantly and then um a neutral parisa is unsurpassed guide of though for those who need to be tamed. The Buddha was the real expert at that. I don't think I've ever met a monk or a teacher that I would say was totally prepared to teach just anybody, no matter what their situation was, even if they were just denying, you know, coming in your face as a teacher and not, not being uh, able to correct them at all. It goes farther than that. It goes much farther than that. Okay. And then the last one is, I'm um, sorry, two more. Buddha means awakened. Into past, future, basically out of present time. It's going to stay in present time. And, and the arahat's really to present moment. Nobody else gets to present moment, but really the arahat can't get to present moment. Okay. And the dog thinks he can get to present moment, but I'm having a disagreement with him. <laughs> That's what's going on, the puppy. All right. So Baga, uh, Bhagawa, Budo Bhagawa. Bhagawa simply means blessed. And this person is blessed because they've accomplished all those things. Um, and it's nothing to do with themselves. This, this is totally uh, as witness to all of these things. And they have to full complete understanding of it. And then... Uh, they're steady as a rock. And that's the kind of person you want to go climb a mountain with or dive in, dive in the ocean with, you see? Because you know they're going to be there, right there, <laughs> like a rock and you can depend on them. That's the kind of person you want to have as a, a, a be around. And if you ever come across somebody that means all of these things, boy, it's a good idea to even just give him an apple. 
<laughs> give her an apple, whatever it is, give them something. Because the merit involved in giving the person something that uh, when that person is able to get this stuff across to you and explain it to you and have you try it, see? So we constantly try when we train with Bonte for a period of time. We were constantly trying to understand, you can't just tell somebody this stuff. You, it's, a, it's a system of inviting them to ask you questions and giving them a question they have to test out for themselves. The Buddha was a master at this. And I think, uh, I don't think I'm a master at this, <laughs> but what I like to do and seems to be effective for some people in retreats is I like to draw when I know there's somebody there, I like to try to get them to see it because the people learn from hearing, people learn from, uh, from reading, but they also, there's a group of people that only learn if we are, um, if they're, if they only learn by seeing, seeing the art or the, pattern of how it works and all of a sudden wow they go like that i see this i get it i get it you know so that's all i got for you and um today and um uh, some of you need to send in a question i won't say whose question it is and i'll give you a class i was going to play a game with you anybody who wants to do this next time will do it but you can do it this week what i'd like you to do is to think up something that he's biting my foot <laughs> you know it's all an issue of changing the dog food <laughs> it's so funny and we got this dog food and all of a sudden it's the size of puppy food and that doesn't say puppy on the bag it just says it's real food and this poor dog he just <laughs> Running more and more, it's crazy. He's got a craving issue here, craving. Okay, so what I was gonna ask you is when I used to go camping, it was a really fun thing uh, with a group of people. We would sit in a circle and they would each tell me what it was they were interested in, in Buddhism or in whatever we were doing in the story, what do you want to have happen? Who is your favorite character? How do you want it to work? And see if I can put a story together for you, because it's fun to see if I can, if I can include everything that you put in it. And then we work it through in, in the, in the way we do with the, with the, um, with the Dhamma by looking in, in the suttas and carrying it through. So it's up to you if you want to do that. But this, this, um, we can start, we can start and keep going with this. I need people to tell me what they want to do, and I'm happy to do it. What comes after the kings, just so you know, is where they start to Narada started going into the Buddha's ministry. And he started to talk about the Buddhist ministry. And then second part was, um, well, ministry. Okay, we can do the ministry next week, but the ministry comes before the teaching. And I don't know how many of you, okay, then after that, you hear about the Buddha's daily routine, what he does on a daily basis. Okay, that's the next part. And, I don't think we can get both of those in. I think we can get one section, the part about the ministry in next week. So we can look at the ministry and how he he talks about it, um, how Narada does it, because he's a really good writer. I hope that you've enjoyed this. And I think we need to sign off. If anybody has any questions, you need to write me, okay? Okay, let's... Say our prayer, okay? The dog is praying, okay. <laughs> May suffering ones be suffering free and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief and may all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit that we have thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth 
devas and nagas of mighty power share this merit of ours. May they long protect the Buddha's dispensation. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Thank you, sister. See you all next week. Bring a friend. Let's do it again. That was fun. <laughs> okay. And I hope that you get here. And anybody else wants to get in on this, you just jump in and put, throw a question in. But if you don't want to do it, you just write something in advance. I don't care who it comes from. We don't tell who it comes from. Just say a question came up and let's go. And we all talk. That's how it works. Okay. <laughs> Have a good week. I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.